So the background graphic here, just sort of the st set the stage, is to really remind you that I, I'm a real observer of exoplanets, so I don't do so much of the theoretical or modeling un work that underpins a lot of this work, but I really like and enjoy using my big telescopes. So this, this shows most of the telescopes I'll mention, plus a few that are coming up in the future that aren't even around yet. Uh, but we'll spend most of the time talking about the Kepler mission, which is actually the smallest one here in the diagram. This is from one of our early press releases from the K2 mission about a year ago. Each of these little dots were one planetary system that we discovered in each of these K2 fields across the sky. And I'll talk about exactly what that all means. Uh, down here below, the biggest one here is actually something that's really exciting coming along in, in just the next year. This is called the TESS mission, which will do what Kepler and K2 did for small patches of the sky, but TESS will do it. We'll look for new planets all across the sky. So basically everywhere that you can look. Um, so TESS is going to be a really exciting mission that we're all looking forward to as well. And then uh, you might recognize things like the Hubble Space Telescope, which we're using to characterize the atmospheres of these planets. The James Webb Space Telescope is sort of the super Hubble that's coming along also in about a year and a half. It's really going to be a superlative facility for studying the atmospheres of these planets. And then uh, big ground-based telescopes and, and other space telescopes coming along in the future that are also going to let us study all of these planets and, and find new planets in exciting ways. So. Uh, we really need all of these observational resources. So if you just remember a few key things at the end of this talk now, uh, here's what they should be. So first, I'll just sort of briefly give you an introduction on how we find and discover and characterize some of these planets and how especially the K2 mission has really given new life to the Kepler mission, which was worried for a time might, might have come to a premature end. I'll talk about the work we do confirming these planets and how we need lots of additional observations from ground-based telescopes. I'll talk a little bit about the legwork that actually goes in, but I'll spend more time, I think, talking to you about the third point here, which is that we're finding hundreds of new planets using the K2 mission uh, in this sort of second life of Kepler. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the exciting work that still lies ahead in terms of exploring exoplanets and, and finding new systems like that. So let's set the stage. So this is a blank canvas here showing uh, the size of a planet. I'm going to plot planet sizes here on the vertical axis relative to the size of Jupiter and the length of a planet's year, so how long a year is on this horizontal axis. So if we plot the solar system planets down here, uh, you can see that they, they really only sort of fall to the right in the rightmost area of this uh, plot. And that seems sort of strange that I've left all of this blank area off to the left here. But that's because what the Kepler mission really showed us unambiguously for the first time is that there are thousands of planets, and most of them, or many of them, have periods, orbital periods, much shorter than those of the solar system planets, uh, even though many of them are much larger than the planets in our, in our inner solar system. So there are thousands of planets sort of, of the, comparable to the size of Earth or Uranus and Neptune, all interior to Mercury's orbit around our own sun. And so in addition, there are lots of giant, very short period planets. We call these hot Jupiters because they're the size of Jupiter, but they're only orbiting in, they only take a couple days to orbit their stars. So they're very close in. And we also see sort of planets that are giant planets on long period orbits like, like Jupiter itself. And uh, the fact that there are all these planets out there really shows that our solar system is not, as we might have predicted 10 or 20 years ago, is not a, the, the typical sort of end product of the process of planet formation. Uh, that solar systems like ours uh, may be, they may not be infrequent, but it's certainly not the case that every system looks like our own. And it's also the case that there aren't many black dots here. Each of these represents a known exoplanet just because they're really tough to find on long period orbits and at very small sizes. So it's not empty because there are no planets like our own. Uh, it's just we haven't quite been able to find very many of them yet. And that's actually one of the original goals of the Kepler mission, which, which I think it's been pretty successful at. So most of these planets were discovered using two different techniques. And maybe some of you have heard of some of these before. The first technique that was really productive in finding new planets is called the uh, radial velocity technique or the Doppler shift technique. And it relies on the fact that as a planet and its star orbit their common center of mass, the planet is actually really dark. This is just a, a movie, obviously, so we can't see the planet itself. We only see the very bright star. And as, they, as the uh, planet and star orbit this common center of mass, 
the light from the star is Doppler shifted back and forth. And we can use spectrographs on things like the automated planet finder up at Lick Observatory, just, just up the road a couple, an hour or two, or at Keck Observatory out in Hawaii. We can use uh, spectrographs on those to measure that Doppler shift and measure the, both the orbital period and the masses of these planets without ever actually seeing the planet directly. So an even more productive technique and the one that the Kepler and now the K2 mission use is called the transit it's called the transit technique. And this relies on the fact that a, when a planet crosses in front of a star, as uh, this movie is not showing, the, uh, the brightness of the planet decreases as the planet crosses in front of it. And if it's a small planet, you get a shallow dip. And if it's a big planet, you get a deeper dip. And so from, from the amount of light that the, that's blocked by the planet crossing in front of the star, we can actually infer how RP, the radius of the planet, relative to the size of the star. We've, we've been studying stars, astronomers have, for over 100 years, so we understand stellar radii pretty well, so we observe the transit depth, and we can measure how, how big the planet is. And if we see dips occurring every 38.6 days, we know that that's the year of that planet, and that's how long it takes it to orbit the star. So, so that's the transit method. So the transit method tells us the size, the radial velocity method tells us the mass. And so if we can measure both of these quantities for particular planets, we can actually start to learn something about what's the sort of bulk composition that a planet is made of. So we can plot here now each of these different points are different exoplanets with radii measured from transits and masses usually measured from radial velocities. And you can see, and these curves here show curves of different sort of model planet composition. So this brown curve here is a rock iron mix, just like we think Earth and Venus are made out of. And you can see there are a number of planets, exoplanets with known with measured properties who lie right along this line. And presumably these are rock iron planets of a bulk composition similar to our Earth. Whether they have water or an atmosphere or life, we don't know at all, but we know at least in a bulk sense they're similar to the rocky planets in our own solar system. We see that there are some planets that may be denser than these, and we see a lot of other planets that are much larger for a given mass, so they must be much lower density. Even if you had a sort of toy model planet that was made entirely of water, which is a very common, relatively rarefied substance, uh, you couldn't have a planet this big. So they have to have a big complement of hydrogen and helium gas. So all of these things must be sort of mini gas giants, sort of smaller scaled down versions of uh, Uranus or Neptune, uh, which have a lot of gas in them. So just by measuring the mass and radius from radial velocities and transits, like a mission like Kepler, we can start to say something about what the planets might be made of. So that's one of the things that we're, we're able to do with these. So there's been a whole suite of different missions. This is just a graphic from NASA showing how the field has sort of moved from ground-based observatories down there in the bottom left up through space-based facilities like Hubble, Spitzer, and now the Kepler mission that we're using to find these planets and now to characterize them as well. And so the latest of these to come along is really the Kepler mission. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on Kepler because I think people here... If you're frequent uh, visitors, you've heard a lot about the Kepler mission. So in brief, Kepler, this is a picture of the spacecraft, which is uh, still up there orbiting around the sun, receding from the Earth. This, is, this, is, this rectangle here is the sort of a subset of the entire sky, most of the sky. And that little pink sp spot right there, that's the area on the sky that the Kepler spacecraft stared at for about four years, essentially continuously staring at about 100, 150,000 stars in that little patch of sky. Uh, and every 30 minutes, made a measurement of how, of how bright all of those stars were, sent the data back to Earth, and all the folks just across the road over at NASA Ames poured over all those data looking for those transit signals that I was just telling you about. And so it's the, the Kepler mission was really a very deep, narrow, focused survey uh, with a, driven by a particular science goal, namely uh, measuring... How frequently do Earth-like planets occur around Earth-like stars when the planets are on Earth-like orbits? And so that's, that's another talk entirely. Uh, but So Kepler ran for about four years, was very successful. Unfortunately, uh, so a spacecraft like Kepler, to point precisely at this field, requires a component in the spacecraft called what are called reaction wheels that just control how well you, how, how accurately you're pointing along each of the three independent axes of space. So you need at least three wheels to point precisely. Kepler went up with four, so it had a spare. Uh, unfortunately, after about four years, not just one but two of these wheels actually ma had malfunctioned and had stopped working. So the spacecraft wasn't able to point precisely anywhere on the sky. 
And so it, it seemed possible that the mission might just be entirely at an end because it couldn't, if you can't point stably, you can't retrieve, you can't measure precisely enough the brightness of these stars. Luckily, some very clever engineers uh, discovered a way to point the spacecraft stably just using two reaction wheels. And this diagram sort of shows it here. The main idea is that you still have two wheels to control two axes, but there's these set of solar panels on the telescope. And if you orient the telescope in the ecliptic plane, so the plane in which all of the planets orbit the sun, you can actually balance solar pressure off of these solar panels so that if you point a little bit off to one side, the unbalanced pressure points you back the other way and, and vice versa. And so you can actually, using solar pressure, you can control the third axis of rotation and point stably at a given patch of sky along the ecliptic plane. And so, but the problem is, because you're always orbiting the sun, uh, you, can only, you can only look at that patch of sky for about three months, or typically it's about 80 days actually, because after that you actually start pointing too close to the sun itself, and you don't want to point your big space telescope at the sun. That does very bad things to it. So, so that means that K2 has embarked now on a new survey of the sky covering all of these patches along what we call the ecliptic plane. So the original Kepler field is up here, and the size of that field is just dictated by the, uh, by the number of CCD detectors in the camera of K2. So we can cover the same patch of sky for 80 days each all along the ecliptic plane. And the numbers here just indicate the, the number of the field. It's been observing them in that order. And so now we're, we just recently got the data down for field uh, 12, which is, which is over here. And so we expect to get data at least through field 16 and maybe a few fields after that. So the difference here, of course, is that whereas Kepler looked at this patch of sky for four years, so even if a planet had an orbital period of one year, uh, you might expect to see several transits. And so you might have a pretty good handle on its orbital period and whether it was really a planet or not. K2 looks at each of these fields for only 80 days. So we're seeing a bigger portion of the sky, but for a smaller amount of time over, over uh, each field. So that has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is if there are really rare things, uh, we're more likely to see them because we're covering 16 times as much sky. Uh, the downside is if we're looking for longer period planets, or especially if you're hoping to find planets that are real Earth analogs, you're out of luck with K2. You're gonna have to go and find another way. But still, K2 is, is this mission that we're using that I and my team are trying to use to continue the original Kepler mission's goal of finding lots, large numbers of interesting new planets for future study. So the main, it's sort of in a nutshell, the, what we're trying to do here is turn big lists of stars, essentially lists of all of the stars that K2 observes in all, each of its campaigns, and we're trying to funnel those down and figure out which of those actually host confirmed planets that we're, we're reliably sure are really there and are not just some sort of uh, you know, non-planetary signal that masquerading as a planet, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, in principle, this is, of course, not the work of a single person. This is one photo of a subset of our team. There are actually a lot of people who have joined the team in the meantime who aren't even, aren't even shown here. Several of these people have actually passed through the Bay Area and or NASA Ames. Um, so it's a group of a effort from a large number of people. I'm just here presenting the results from all of us to you. So the bad news, the trouble with trying to do this, and uh, kept ground-based transit surveys encountered this problem, and uh, the original Kepler mission ran into it to some extent, and K2 does as well, is that there are lots of different astrophysical scenarios shown here, each of which can sort of masquerade as a planetary transit. If you have a, d a dark planet with its shadow crossing in front of the star, uh, in principle, it's, it can be tough to distinguish that from a small planet transiting in front of the star, or a eclipsing stellar eclipsing binary blended with the light from a brighter star that's closer to Earth, or even from an eclipsing binary with almost equal sizes where just, uh, they're sort of grazing, they only block out a little bit of the light. In principle, with only the photometry, the measurements of brightness that we get from K2, we're not always able to tell which of these scenarios we've observed when we see that U-shaped transit dip. So that's the bad news. The good news is that that means we get to go out to lots of observatories across the world and uh, travel to exciting places and, and collect ancillary data to confirm or rule out these different planets. 
So this is a picture of me and my uh, student Arturo Martinez. Down, we got to go down to Chile for several uh, week-long observing runs up in the Andy Mountains. And uh, so he took some near-infrared spectroscopy of some late-type stars to in improve our knowledge of their stellar parameters and confirm whether they were hosting planets or not. Uh, we also get optical spectroscopy at much higher spectral resolution from facilities like the Automated Planet Finder that I mentioned right up here at Lick, uh, and also from telescopes out at Keck in Hawaii. So we get to go to both local and exotic locations there. Uh, we get not just high resolution spectroscopy, but we get very high acuity imaging from techniques like uh, adaptive optics imaging, which even though we're on the ground looking through the Earth's blurry atmosphere, essentially allow us to get uh, diffraction limited images, essentially images quality comparable to what you could get in space, to look very closely for, this is a picture of Erica Gonzalez, my student who's working on this, uh, to look for other point sources that might indicate that there were multiple stars all in the big aperture that K2 was using to measure the stellar brightness. And so this is one of the few surveys where we're doing this sort of high acuity imaging where we're hoping to see no other little point sources. Some people do these sort of surveys looking for other points, hoping that they are planets. We're just hoping not to see any other stars, because if we don't, it's probably not a stellar binary. So we, we take all of these data and all of these measurements, and uh, all we have to do is put them into this simple flowchart and follow them from the top up to the, down to the bottom. And so once we've done this, we can figure out whether a planet is validated and, and confirmed, and that makes us happy. Uh, we're sort of, we feel confused and upset. If we turn out it was one of those false positive situations, and in some cases we're just not able to actually determine what, whether the planet is really a planet or not, so it just remains a candidate. So, so you just have to follow that simple plan. So... There's a lot that goes into that, and you feel, should feel free to ask me questions about it afterward. I don't want to dwell on it now. The result of all this, though, after we flow down here to these three guys here at the bottom, is that in the first two years of K2, we found about 200 confirmed planets, planets that we're really sure about are, are really planetary and not any of those false positives. And we have, between us and other teams out there, there are probably three or four times that number of candidates that are still out there or things that have been deemed false positives. Uh, so about 100 planets per year, which is, if you are familiar with the Kepler mission, is a much lower yield than the original Kepler mission uh, was able to produce. And I think that's really a testament to the, to the original design of the Kepler mission when it's able to, using all of those reaction wheels, point stably at the same patch of sky for a long time, which is a much more stable platform for this sort of science than K2 was. Uh, but, but luckily, we're still, able to get, we're still getting something pretty productive out of K2. So what's shown here on this plot, each of these gray points, so this is a measure of how bright a planet's star is. We like stars that are brighter because it's easier to measure their transits later on. It's easier to measure their radial velocities and measure the planet masses. It's easier to study the planet's atmosphere. So we like planets around bright stars. Uh, we also like smaller planets because, I don't know, these days everyone gets, is getting more and more excited about small planets. It has something to do with this 1.0 1, 1 Earth radii, I think. So what we really want is to find large numbers of small planets orbiting bright stars. Each of these gray points are planets that were known before the K2 mission really got going. And so most of these were actually produced by the Kepler mission, the original Kepler mission. And so you can see there are thousands of points there. They just all blend together. Uh, and and there's, there's a lot of them. And there's not nearly as many as the, of, of our K2 systems, which are shown here, color-coded by the, the temperature of the star there. Uh, even though I made our symbols much bigger than the Kepler planet signals symbols, there, there still aren't as many, obviously. But what's exciting to us is that there are much larger numbers of these planets at the, around brighter stars. The sort of typical stellar magnitude for our sample is maybe two or three magnitudes, so about a factor of 10 brighter than the stars found by the Kepler mission. And that's entirely a product of the fact that we're surveying a larger fraction of the sky for a shorter period of time. So what that means is, if I, we sort of bin this up and quantify it, it means that it, for sort of brighter planets around brighter stars, it's sort of everything smaller than Jupiter, we're increasing the number of planets known, small planets known to orbit bright stars by something like a factor of 50%. And this is after the first two years. We expect K2 to last another two years beyond this. So that means that by the end of the K2 mission, we should have effectively doubled the number of small planets known to orbit these bright stars. And again, that means that we're finding we'll have now twice as many planets to measure interesting transits on, 
measure radial velocities and planet masses, study planet atmospheres. Uh, so when we made this plot and actually found this result, we're really excited. This is real vindication to us of our whole K2 effort, because our whole goal was really exactly this, finding lots of planets orbiting bright stars. And so we're really accomplishing that. So in, in principle, each of these points here could be a little story in itself. We don't have that much time. So I'll just walk you through three mini case studies to talk to you about some of the examples. And you don't have to remember these numbers either. Astronomers give all sorts of weird names to the stars and planets that they look at. Um, these are three examples of that. So the first of these is K23. And uh, K23, B, C, D. B, C, and D are the names of three planets orbiting the star called K23. And it's called K2 because it was a planetary system discovered by K2. The three means that it was the third planetary system that K2 identified and confirmed. But the three is also sort of fun because there are three planets orbiting the system. So this was one we identified about, I guess about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now. Uh, and it was the first multi-planet system discovered by K2. Uh, and it was the first system found of planets that K2 found orbiting a small, low-mass, cool star, an M dwarf, we call it. And you, what you can see here at the top, this top panel, each of these dots is one of those 30-minute measurements of the brightness of the star, called K23. And you can see that it extends, these are not years, these are days. Uh, they extend about 75, 80 days, so the full length of one K2 campaign. And each of these little dips, which I've marked here with a color-coded line, is one transit of one of those different planets. And if you look, period if you look at that uh, plot, you can convince yourself that the different colors occur periodically on three different periods. And if I fold them on orbital periods of about 10 days, about 20 days, and about 45 days, you can see that there are indeed three coherent transit signals here in this system. And this system was fun. For, we thought it was pretty fun for a couple of reasons. First, the sizes of the planets are all pretty small. So the innermost planet is the biggest at about two times the size of the Earth, and the outermost one is only about 50% bigger than the size of the Earth. And what we know from studying other planetary systems is that one and a half times the size of the Earth is about the point where we expect planets to be dominated by rock rather than just be sort of miniature gas giants. So we think at least this K23d could be a, a rocky terrestrial world even if the outer two planets, or sorry, the inner two planets are, are maybe gas giants. And it's interesting, too, that we think in our solar system, I think we're used to thinking of the small planets are on the inside. As you go farther out, the planets get bigger. K23 is obviously an example of the opposite. The innermost planet is the largest. As you go out, the planets get smaller rather than bigger. Uh, also interesting to us, if we look at the amount of flux incident from the host star onto these planets relative to the amount of flux incident on the Earth in an average sense. Uh, while the innermost planet is pretty hot, 10 times more irradiated than the Earth, the outermost planet, there's a big uncertainty here, but in principle it could be a level of irradiation comparable to that received by the Earth. So, so that was kind of fun too because it was a planet that could be rocky, could have comparable surface temperatures to the Earth, of course, it could also have sur comparable surface temperatures to the moon, which would be you know, much less hospitable than the Earth. So this isn't a planet that we can say has an atmosphere or not, but it's actually something we've, we're already looking at now with the Hubble Space Telescope to try and start learning something about whether it has an atmosphere, and if it does, what might it be made of. Uh, and, and this K, K magnitude here is just to remember magnitudes are how astronomers measure brightness, I mentioned. And 8.6 just means pretty bright, so, so we were happy about that. So another one of these that we uh, identified just last year is a system now called HD3167. And so this one, we only identified two planets that you can see here in these plots. Uh, one of them was a very long period planet with an orbital period of about 30 days and about three times the size of the Earth. So almost certainly a, little, a gas giant, a little smaller than Uranus or Neptune. And there's this other little thing that's marked with red that you can hardly even see in the upper plot. But when you fold it on a period of about 0.96 days, so something like 23 and a half hours, you see this coherent transit signal. That means that this little planet is whizzing around its host star every 23 hours. Uh, so every, every day you age by a year on this planet. So not a happy place, maybe. Uh, also really hot because it's so close to this star. And its size is 1.7 times the size of the Earth, so sort of right on that borderline of where it could be rocky or it could be a little gas giant, so we don't know. 
And this star is even brighter. Astronomers do everything backwards. We're very perverse that way. So a smaller number means a brighter star. Uh, so this meant it was a great target for radial velocity measurements. So we went out with the, each of these color-coded points are measurements we made from the high-res spectrograph in Hawaii, the APF spectrograph right up at, on Mount Hamilton, uh, and the Harps North spectrograph. Uh, and each of these points is, is shown here measured over, over about half a year. This blue curve here is the model that we ended up converging on to, to fit all of these data in, a, in an optimal sense. And so the residuals here are more or less flat. And so this is a paper led by Jesse Christensen that's been submitted recently. And what took us quite a bit of time to, uh, to identify these planets and figure out their radial velocity signals and their masses. But in the end, we're able to get a very clear measurement of the mass of planet B. You can see its periodic Doppler shift phase folded on its orbital period here. Uh, you can see planet C, the 30-day period planet as well. Uh, and what took us so long in the end was that there's actually a planet D, a non-transiting planet with a period of about eight and a half days uh, that we didn't we could, didn't know about and could never have known about from the K2 photometry. And so that added a lot of complexity to the analysis. Uh, in addition, if you, if you know anything about signal processing, you can imagine that looking for a signal with a period of about one day when you're sampling it about once every night is a very challenging aliasing problem. So we need a lot of data from multiple facilities to really zero in on these planet Doppler shifts. The result of this, though, is that we can plop these two planets down on one of these mass radius diagrams. And so planet B right here, the innermost one, is right on that curve uh, with Earth and Venus of a rock-iron composition. So indeed, as you'd expect for something that's being totally blasted by this star and of this size, is uh, probably a rock-iron planet, uh, albeit one with a surface temperature of something like 2,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, planet C, on the other hand, sits up here comfortably above all of these sort of denser material composition lines, confirming what we suspected, that it must be a miniature gas giant with at least a thin veneer, if not a thicker one, of hydrogen and helium. And so these planets also, at least the outermost one, we're also planning to target with the Hubble Space Telescope and with the James Webb Telescope coming up in the next years. Uh, the final system I'll talk to you about is uh, the, this is this is just another plot like the ones I've showed you of transit photometry. So this, these are days on the horizontal axis, and these this is the stellar brightness. Uh, this photometry is actually from the Spitzer Space Telescope, but K2 has also observed this system, and so each of these color-coded diamonds here now indicates an individual planet. And this is there's actually it turns out seven planets that were found here. Three were known before. And this is the system you might have heard about a couple few weeks ago called TRAPPIST-1. And so this, this is an artist's conception here of, the, uh, of each of these little seven planets. Obviously, the planets are, are bigger in this image than they actually would be. Uh, they don't almost run into each other in real life. So three of these were discovered originally. The Spitzer Space Telescope found four more of them. And then K2, just a, few, a week or two ago, downloaded its data, and papers were published within just a few days showing that all of these planets were indeed confirmed by the K2 mission, and the seventh planet, they were able to get multiple transits and confirm its orbit. So, uh, so this is a system uh, not discovered by K2, but such an exciting one that has generated a lot of interest. Part of the reason is that all seven of these planets range from, I think, half the size of the Earth to something like one and a half times the size of the Earth. So presumably, all of them are more or less rocky and Earth-like in terms of their bulk composition. Also, as you can see in this, maybe you can see in this sort of artist's conception, although there's these ice crystals because the outer planet is cold, and there's steam because the inner planet is hot, there's just liquid puddles lying around here because maybe one or two or, or maybe three of these planets lie in what astronomers call the habitable zone, where if it has surface water and if it has an atmosphere, either of which we know, uh, the, surface, the water on the surface could indeed be liquid. So it's one of the best places we've found to date where we could hope to characterize the atmosphere of the planets and, uh, and where the planets lie in a very interesting, maybe, maybe Earth-like region of irradiation and, and other properties. But that's, it's going to take a lot of extra effort to confirm that. This is just a second plot on the TRAPPIST-1 system uh, showing, showing the things actually to scale. So this is the sun, which does not fit on this screen. This is why we have to tear the building down, because we need a bigger screen to fit the sun. Uh, 
Trappist-1 is this tiny little red dwarf. It's almost, it's almost not even a star. It's so low mass and so small. And it's basically the size of Jupiter. These things are all on the same scale here. So it's really, it's really remarkable just how small this star is. Uh, and so these are all of the planets in the system here to scale. And you can see they're bigger than Jupiter's moons, uh, but they're really comparable in size to Venus and Earth. So this is an exciting system. I wasn't involved, I should say, in any of the TRAPPIST-1 work. I just wish I were. And I think it's one of the more exciting systems that's come around. So you all, all deserve to hear about it. So that, that's just three examples of systems that K2 has discovered recently and, that we've, and, and or with follow-up observations that we've worked on characterizing. Uh, one of the goals that I'm really interested in answering with K2 also, something we're just getting started on, is to not just find individual planets, uh, which some, some people sort of accuse us of just stamp collecting. We're just finding interesting individual systems with no coherent story. So one of the big coherent stories that our team is trying to answer is this one, to answer the question, how common are these small planets, especially the ones orbiting these small, cool, low-mass stars? So we know from the original Kepler mission, uh, this is just a plot by Andrew Howard, but there have been probably dozens of, of people that have led papers on the same topic, that big hot planets, this is radius and period again, short period planets that are big, like hot Jupiters, are very rare, and that planets on longer orbital periods, maybe the size of the Earth to the size of Neptune, are much more common. So I, even, I drew a little Earth here. There's a question mark because I think we're still waiting for the final results in the next few months from Kepler as to whether Earth's, Earth analogs are common or not. But in general, we know around sun-like stars, which is what Kepler focused on, that small, longer period planets are more common than big, uh, short period planets. Uh, what we'd like, th the trouble is Kepler, so Kepler ma did some good work on this for these small, low mass stars as well, but Kepler's main mission was really to answer these sort of questions for sun-like stars. So if you look at the, this is now the effective temperature, the temperature of the stars that both Kepler and that K2 looked at. You can see Kepler is the dashed line and K2 is the solid line. Uh, so the sun's temperature is about here. And so you can see that the Kepler mission, by far, targeted mainly sun-like stars because it was driven primarily by this overarching science mission of measuring planet occurrence around stars like the sun. K2 is much more community-driven. So actually all of us in the exoplanet community send in proposals to NASA saying, I would like to observe this star or that star for this science case or to answer that question. And by the process of peer review, stars are selected. And what you can see here is that although there's still a lot of sun-like stars targeted by K2, there's also this huge peak in cooler, we call later type stars, what we call M and K dwarfs. These are stars that are much cooler, much smaller than the sun. Uh, and it's something that Kepler didn't look at a lot of them. And that's mainly a fraction of just looking at this single patch of sky. Just by virtue of looking at 16 times bigger area on the sky, K2 is able to look at many more of these small, low-mass stars. And so something we're working on doing now is measuring the occurrence rate of planets around these using the much bigger sample of these stars from K2. Uh, so the way we're doing this is actually kind of fun. We're getting in, is anyone here familiar with the uh, Zooniverse website? Few, few people? Okay, so, so Zooniverse is a site that does uh, citizen science. It just, uh, as far as I can tell, it tricks innocent, the innocent public into doing our science work for us. Uh, but, but, but that works out for us. And so we were actually putting together a, a, a project website on the uh, Zooniverse site, which will use our data from the K2 mission to identify new interesting planet candidates. And not only will we identify these uh, you know, new interesting planets, but by injecting simulated planet signals of known period and known depth, we're also going to be able to measure our survey completeness. How well are we able to either find or how often do we miss planets of different types? And so then we're going to be able to convert our, uh, our catalogs of known discovered planets into occurrence rates of different types of planets orbiting these low mass stars. So if you, if you want, you're uh, welcome to check this out. Uh, the, we're just finishing ramping this up, and it's going to go fully live in about a week. It'll, the way it works is it just takes you to little diagrams that may or may not show things that look like transits, and you choose you choose which of these situations you are, uh, you think it is. Uh, unsure is always always a good bet. 
So, so we're excited about what this citizen science is going to do, both in terms of engaging the public in, and in, in the interest in our science, and also in terms of um, you know, what we're going to be able to find out about planet occurrence from K2. So I talked a lot about a number of these, how we're using ground-based facilities. I only briefly alluded to, in the interest of time, how we're using Hubble and Spitzer to start to study the atmospheres of these things. Uh, and we're, of course, finding all of these planets on using Kepler and now K2. The next big mission coming along is the TESS mission. And TESS, as I said, is the all-sky survey of, exoplan of transiting exoplanets, which is launching early next year. So whereas K2 is running right now, and it builds on the legacy of the original Kepler mission, uh, TESS is going to be what's coming next. So there's sort of this lo logical pro progression. And it kind of works out well, because both in terms of sky coverage, uh, we sort of transition gradually from Kepler, small patch of sky, to, to K2, bigger region, to TESS, almost all of the sky. So TESS will cover almost all of it. But it also transitions very nicely in terms of the temporal coverage. How long of a time baseline do we have on each of these stars? For Kepler, it was four years. For K2, it's about 80 days. For most of TESS's targets, it'll only be about 30 days, so it'll be even shorter. Uh, but you notice I made TESS's solar panels go up here a bit above K2, because actually, for a small patch of sky, TESS will actually observe for almost a full year. So it's, it's going to be a, a wide range. And TESS will do this by, here's a little diagram of the spacecraft. It will tile these rectangular zones for about 30 days each. And as it rotates around the sky during the course of a full year, uh, you can see that for most of the sky, it'll only cover it for about 27 days, this blue cover. But as you get closer and closer to the ecliptic pole, uh, the coverage will increase because especially up near the pole, it'll be observed essentially continuously by TESS. So you'll get almost a full year of coverage. And then TESS will flip around and do the opposite hemisphere in the sky. So a two-year mission, it will tessel tessellate almost the entire sky. Uh, and this little circle here is what's called the James Webb Continuous Viewing Zone. That's where the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to continuously observe any of the most interesting planets that TESS finds. So we're very excited about TESS. To just show an example, I showed this diagram earlier of our K2 planets compared to what planets had been found before and showed you how we'd found lots of new planets that are even brighter. Uh, and if we plot what the test mission projects as their yield by the end of the full test mission, you can see these little blue stars. There are even more of them, and they're ev around even brighter stars than what we're finding with K2. So it's really exciting that... TESS is just going to build on everything we're doing with K2 and really extend this uh, in even more exciting directions. So uh, I think, so I think we're, we're, uh, we're doing all this. TESS is coming along right now. I'll just briefly mention that the James Webb Space Telescope, which I alluded to before, is also coming along very soon. And it uses a technique we call transmission spectroscopy by measuring the transit depth of a planet at different wavelengths of light so if you measure a transit depth at one wavelength and then at another wavelength, the planet has an atmosphere, the depths may actually be different. And so something like Hubble or James Webb can use transit observations to tell us exactly what the atmospheric makeup of a planet is. And so this is just an example spectrum of, of a, a transiting object with an atmosphere. So you can see signatures from methane and carbon monoxide and other features. And so things, targets like our HD3167 that I talked to you about, this is just a simulation uh, that I ran for a particular t assumption about what the atmosphere could be made of of this planet whose mass we've recently measured. And with just one or two transit observations with James Webb, we'll be able to get a very pretty precise measurement of what the planet's atmospheric makeup is. You can see that these simulated measurements here with their error bars would track pretty well with this model and would be able to back out what the planet's atmosphere is made of. So James Webb, uh, we're, using, we're using Hubble right now to do this, James Webb launches in the sort of middle, middle end of next year, and then its observations start. The trouble with James Webb, and then, well, sorry, and then TESS comes along as well to deliver really great targets. The trouble, such as it is, is that the proposals to use James Webb in its first year or two of operations are actually due less than a year from now, which stresses me out every time I think about it, uh, and they de are definitely due much earlier than the TESS mission even gets on sky. So it's really great that we have the K2 mission operating now that's delivering the best planets we can possibly find today so we don't have to waste any time waiting around for tests. Uh, so that's one of the big goals we've had with K2, and it's working out very, very effectively, we think. 
So in summary, uh, K2, despite the, uh, I think the reports of Kepler's death were greatly exaggerated, K2 is still operating very successfully and we're getting a lot of exciting science out of it. Uh, we have to collect lots of additional data and observations, as I mentioned, uh, but that's, that's a plus, I think, not a minus. And we're finding large numbers of new interesting planets. Some of these will be good for atmospheric studies, for measuring the masses or bulk compositions, uh, measuring dynamical interactions of all of these different planets. As we saw with TRAPPIST-1, maybe even finding planets that could be in the habitable zones of these stars, where someday we could hope to search for signs of life. And so there's lots of exciting work that lies ahead in that direction. Uh, it's been great to share, share this work with all of you. So thank you.